So we come to our culminating act. Uh, it's Aubrey de Grey. He sports a beard of biblical proportions and uh, also invokes the proverbial biblical 120 years as an imminent possibility that many of us will be enjoying. From your lips to God's ear, Aubrey, come and tell us how we can do it. Oh, thanks very much, Moses. And um, because I am the last speaker, um, as opposed to blower, um, I thought I would do what is traditional for the last speaker, and on behalf of all the other invited speakers, thank Moses and his team for putting together such a fantastic meeting. So, um, this is my title. As you can see, it has two parts. Um, these are the questions that I spend my time answering. I am pr predominantly a biologist, but I do a great deal of outreach work, and I find myself spending more or less an equal amount of time <coughs> on persuading people that the answers to both of these questions are yes. But at this point, of course, I only have 20 minutes, or, well, I don't know, maybe 25 since I've just been so nice to Moses. And, um, and I will, um, therefore, try to answer both of them. And the reason I'm going to do that is because of the nature of the commonest answers that people actually give to these two questions. And when I say the answers they give, I don't exactly mean the words they use. I mean the answers that they betray by what they don't say and by the... Um, the, the attention that they pay and the eagerness with which they change the subject. Because the answers that they give are here. What is wrong with this picture? You get the idea? The problem is these are mutually reinforcing. That's a really bad thing. And I spend a lot of my time just persuading people, prizing these questions apart, and persuading people that it's fundamentally stupid to try this sort of answer to these questions, to answer them by answering the other one. But ultimately, it starts with this. If we want to know anything about how to manipulate some aspect of nature, then we have to understand the problem in order to be able to engage in the rational design of a solution. And <coughs> from, the, from a purely mechanistic point of view, we can describe aging as I have done on this slide. Very simple concept, which can be divided into two parts, an ongoing part and an eventual part. Essentially, we have something that goes on throughout our lives, even starting before we're born, the accumulation of a variety of different molecular and cellular side effects of uh, normal processes that keep us alive. I'm using the word metabolism just to encompass all the things that go on in our bodies that keep us going from one day to the next and one from, from one year to the next. And damage is the word that I'm going to use today to describe those side effects. Okay? That's the specific meaning that I'm going to attach to the word damage for this talk. The second part is that eventually, only eventually, when there is enough damage, things start to go wrong. The damage starts to get in the way of metabolism and stop it working so well, make things go downhill and start age-related diseases emerging and so on. But the fact is, this doesn't happen at once. It only happens in the second half of life. I'm now 45 years old, and I can still you know, think as fast and run as fast, more or less, as I could when I was 25. And the reason is because I haven't yet got that threshold level of damage that materially impairs my metabolism. All right, so what does that mean in terms of what we might do about it? All right, there we go. Um, well, <clears throat> classically, there are really two ways to look at it. I'm going to call them the geriatrics approach and the gerontology approach. And they both look pretty, pretty reasonable at first sight. Essentially, what we've got down here is what I just told you. Metabolism causes damage. Damage causes pathology. The geriatrics approach is to identify the pathologies when they're emerging and then they're at an early stage and to try to hold back the sands of time, so to speak, and slow down the rate at which those patho pathologies advance and progress to a really debilitating and eventually life-threatening state. The gerontology approach says, well, maybe prevention is better than cure, it usually is, therefore let's get stuck in at an earlier stage in the chain of events, let's try and in some way clean up metabolism so that it just doesn't lay down these various types of damage at the rate that it would naturally do so. And that sounds pretty promising as well because, of course, it would delay the age at which the damage reaches the threshold level I just mentioned that causes pathologies. Here's the problem with the geriatrics approach. Rather a lot goes wrong with you when you get to be a Zoomer and it, gets, a lot, it get wor gets worse at an accelerating rate, as we all know. You don't have to be a biologist to, to write this slide. It's pretty miserable. And essentially, the geriatrics approach does suffer from the problem of intervening too late. 
essentially there are all these precursors of damage of pathology, in other words, the damage continuing to accumulate through, uh, as time goes on, and that means that the geriatrician's job is getting progressively harder. So then, what's wrong with metabolism? Well, um, you heard this a little bit earlier on. This is essentially the answer. Metabolism is unbelievably complicated. This is a, you know, a, a depiction of a small subset of what we know about uh, how metabolism works. That's bad enough. What's even worse is that this is a small subset of what we know about how metabolism works. And it doesn't even say anything about the stuff that we don't know, which completely dwarfs what we do know, quite apart from all the stuff that we don't even know that we don't know, and so on. So, so, so basically, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit hopeless. And as Michael Rose told us in the previous session, um, there is some progress now in uh, characterizing metabolism better, but we've still got a very long way to go. Here is how you build a car to last. You build it really well at the beginning with you know, corrosion-resistant metal and all that sort of stuff. And this is indeed a 50-year-old car. That's, my, I don't know, that's probably three or four times as old as your average car will last before getting into a bad enough state that uh, you'll go and get a new one. But why did I say VW bugs up there? Very simple answer. There are just as many 50-year-old VW bugs out there on the road as there are 50-year-old Land Rovers. And it's not because the VW bugs were built with corrosion-resistant metal and everything. It's because they've got style. And their owners fell in love with them and did an exceptional amount of maintenance to them. And they've been doing that ever since they were built. And these cars, even though they are 50 years old, are still working just as well as when they rolled off the production line. So this tells us that for simple man-made machines, and of course, I, didn't, I don't just need to talk about cars, you can think about aeroplanes or houses or any other machine. Maintenance works. If you ha can do sufficiently comprehensive maintenance on a machine, then you can keep it going, and not just going, just about going, I mean going in a fully functional, useful state, as long as you like. And that is the point with aging, too. Because there is a third way a completely different paradigm for going about the elimination of the problem of aging. It is to go in and repair the damage periodically so that it never reaches this pathogenic level, this level that causes the various debilitations of aging. And this gets the best of both worlds. On the one hand, it's sufficiently preemptive, it's sufficiently early in the game that it doesn't have the problem of the downward spiral, the accumulation of precursors, because by definition, the damage doesn't have precursors. Um, so, so it gets away from the geriatrician's problem, but also it gets away from the problem of the gerontological approach, because we're intervening late enough in the game that we don't have to interfere with metabolism itself. Damage is not so complicated. So far, I've been using this term damage in the abstract. I haven't told you anything about what damage actually is, except I think I said it was at the molecular and cellular level. What is it in actual practice? Well, this is what it is. Not very many different things go wrong with us. Or rather, I should be a little stricter. Not many different types of things go wrong with us. All of the various phenomena that qualify as damage by the definition I'm using today, in other words, intermediates between metabolism and pathology, intermediates between being alive and being dead, okay, all the things that qualify as damage by that definition fit into these seven major categories. And yes, these are major categories, but they're useful categories for a reason that I'm going to get onto in a moment. Look at what I'm talking about here, though. I'm talking about perfectly straightforward, down-to-earth, concrete phenomena here. The accumulation of indigestible molecules of one sort or another, like, for example, oxidized cholesterol in the artery. Um, the loss of cells, cells dying and not being naturally replaced by the division of other cells. Things like that. Mutations in our chromosomes that, of course, are, con um, are, are a prerequisite for cancer. We have solutions to all of these things, and within each category, even though there may be many examples from one tissue to the next and so on, um, more or less the same sort of therapy will work. So, for example, in the case of cell loss, essentially that's what stem cell therapy is for. And I think that this is likely to be able to give human beings, with the first generation of these therapies, maybe 30 extra years of healthy life. Specifically, it will do so by bona fide rejuvenation. These are all actual bona fide repair and maintenance approaches that restore the structure of the body to what it was at a younger age by removing damage. They don't just slow down the accumulation of subsequent damage. So that means that we can apply this to people who are already Zoomers before the therapies start. And, in that, mean, and that means, of course, before the therapies are even developed. That's pretty good news. Um, however, it ain't defeating aging. So, since I, don't, I tend to talk about defeating aging altogether, I have a little bit more to tell you in order to justify my conclusions. 
So the second time we apply these therapies, they won't be the same. They'll be able to fix the types of damage that they could fix 20 years previously, but they're also going to be able to fix some proportion, let's say half, of the damage that they couldn't fix 20 years previously. So that's the orange line. And as you can see, the orange line does not suffer from the problem of diminishing returns. So long as the therapies are improved in their comprehensiveness sufficiently rapidly, you get a situation where over the long term, not just in the short term, people are becoming biologically younger as they are becoming chronologically older. And that is the fundamental point about the impact of progress, technological progress, subsequent to the achievement of this initial breakthrough, this first generation rejuvenation panel that will give us maybe an extra 30 years. Last, last point. This, I feel, is the biggest single reason why I have to spend so much of my time trying to break down this unbelievable torrent of ambivalence with regard to the stuff I work on. It's just too big a problem. Here's a quote from Douglas Adams. This is, you don't have to read this, this is, this is from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and it's about the size of the universe. It says here, The Hitchhiker's Guide says, the introduction begins, space is really big. You just won't believe it. And so it goes on like this, and it's actually, I've abbreviated this quite a lot here. It's great, it's a great passage. But here's the point. The simple truth is, interstellar distances will not fit into the human brain. We, our brains are too small. Now, in this case, it's not our brains that are too small, it's our hearts that are too small. We just don't have the emotional capacity to handle the magnitude of the human cost of aging. So we have to find some way to put our heads in the sand. Now, I am not talking about myself there. My heart is big enough, and I'm working on this. If you think that you're happy to accept that your heart is too small to cope with this problem, then, you know, good night and good luck, as somebody said some time ago. But if not, if you do think that this is a world worth having, a world without all the suffering that aging causes, then, well, you know, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm certainly not the only one anymore, and now's the time to join me. This is a quote from that icon of contemporary moral philosophy, George Bush, <laughs> um, who, who said this about the Terry Schiavo case, and it applies just as much in this case. Since this is, uh, of course, the leader of the USA, I want, to, I want a final point just to contrast the USA with Canada here. Um, Michael, I don't think was mentioned, is Canadian. Michael, Ray Michael Rose is also Canadian. An enormous number of the people who are actually getting up off their backsides and helping and really contributing to this movement come from this country. So I am absolutely privileged to be here speaking to an audience in, in, in Toronto today. The AARP is, of course, an organization that's been around a long time. It's got an extraordinarily large amount of money. And it is not exactly leading the charge to support the efforts that I've told you about today. So if the CARP can show that how backward the Americans are in this way as well as so many others, then that would be great. Thank you very much. Needless to say that Aubrey's uh, opponents in uh, aging research think he's a bit of a lunatic. <laughs> but what I love about Aubrey is that uh, he's outraged by what my teacher, Irving Layton, used to call the incomparable lousiness of getting old. So fight on, Aubrey. We're with you. <laughs> <laughs>